So, hi, Craig. Welcome to the La Collection podcast. Hello, Katie. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So we are here to talk about the uh, drop that's coming up, the first exhibition that we're doing with JSG Boggs Estate. Um, and we're going to be launching a very exciting project. Uh, this is something that we've worked together on with the estate, yourself and La Collection. And we're very proud to, to do this uh, legacy project. This one of our first legacy projects with an estate. And we have the honor of speaking with you today as not only the curator of the collection, uh, but also uh, a friend of the artist. Um, briefly, I'll, I'll introduce myself, uh, very short. I'm a director of um, art, art partnerships here at La Collection. And this is why we've been working together. But now I'd like to pass over to you so you can introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Craig Whitford. Uh, for over 30 years, I conducted rare coin auctions, and I was also a mint, U.S. mint historian, uh, where they strike the coins, and had a deep interest in the history of currency, uh, including those artists that created currency on canvas or on paper. And, wow. Uh, so it's always been a lot of fun. My goodness. So your knowledge really uh, goes across the board. It's, uh, it's very technical knowledge, perhaps I could say, but also then this crossover into the artistic side of things, which is, you know, really where we, we find bogs um, running alongside. So maybe you could kind of segue in here into how you came across bogs or bogs as artwork. Well, I had seen articles about him through the early 90s. And uh, then in 1992, uh, PBS launched his video, Money Man, uh, which was shown mm -hmm. across the country. And uh, I really enjoyed that. So I somewhat tracked Boggs down. Uh, at the time, really? I, had a, I had a company that was called It's Only Money. And okay. um, and we sold various products in that that showed currency, related to currency, um, including many items that got him in trouble. Ah, so so you you you'd been selling his work already, or showed his work already, or no? I was uh, offering to collectors. Um, Items that displayed money, like ties, um, things like that, also created a line of stationery and postcards and uh, all that offered money. And uh, Boggs was intriguing, to say the least. Yes. So you actually came across uh, him in a way, I suppose a lot of people did at the time, which is in these news articles, these almost documentaries. I think he generated quite a lot of curiosity. Would that be fair to say? Oh, most definitely. And challenging what people actually thought about currency or what they thought about conducting a transaction. Okay, so you saw Boggs on the television, not your average uh, character, I imagine, but so someone who intrigued you. How did you go about tracking him down? Uh, I had written a couple of letters, and I did get a response to those in 1993. And uh, we set to meet at the uh, Florida United Numismatist Convention in January of 1994. And that was actually our first face-to-face -face meeting. Okay, so this is a kind of like finally potentially meeting, uh, you know, someone who you admire moment. How did knowing his character and his personality? How did that meeting go? Uh, exceptionally well. So yeah. um, he always had what seemed to be a set of rules that he lived by, and uh, he wasn't someone who you could actually purchase a piece of his art from. Uh, it had to be uh, done in a transactional form. And at the 1994 Fun Convention, he created what he uh, deemed Perfect Counterfeit 1 and Perfect Counterfeit 2, 
where somehow, and we're still not exactly sure how he did it, he would erase the signatures on U.S. $1 notes and then sign your name and his name as replacement signatures. Okay. And, and, and you even don't know how this was done with all your knowledge of, of numismatry, of, of coins, of, of bills, let's say. Did, did you ever find out? We're still working on it. <laughs> um, You're kidding me. No. You know, we tested uh, uh, several different types of solutions and things like that. But his paper was crisp and clean. Uh, from the signatories. And uh, so within his archives, we found an interesting little device, a machine, you might call it, uh, that we're still uh, trying to understand. Okay, so fascinating, because you guys would go on to become quite, I I don't know, at least a friendship. So is this something that he kind of persisted in keeping as a secret, or, or is it simply that you didn't kind of pursue the question at the time? Uh, I pursued the question, but he kept it as a secret, Um, as he would uh, many of his projects um, as to what he did. But his his whole interest in creating the notes was to make them the best he could. So So when you say, you know, he he was a little secretive about the process, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Uh, just as with uh, trying to acquire his art, uh, it was a process. Uh, you couldn't go necessarily directly through him. You had to go through uh, a gallery owner, perhaps, or try to buy one half of whatever he produced um, from the place that he spent the note uh, and to see if they would uh, let go of it. Uh, but he never revealed uh, his secrets. Uh, he would, I did a couple of editions with him, and he would even go into the printing plate and make changes after it was even produced. So, yeah, he liked to, to really kind of almost have this kind of magic, this kind of uh, illusion. There was always something you, you couldn't always grasp the full process, like a like almost in a magic trick. But I think it'd be interesting to, you know, go back to these transactions for anyone who's listening to us and who doesn't really know what this means in the context of Boggs' work, because many artists have treated the theme of of money, uh, dollar signs notably. Um, Boggs is indeed known, of course, for drawing, hand drawing or designing these notes, which are, which are, definitely distinguishable from uh, real currency and in no way counterfeits. But uh, you'll hear a lot about process and transaction when you hear about bogs. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about that because you've also witnessed it. So maybe hearing from you would be interesting. Oh, most definitely. Uh, Bogs could work for weeks or months on a particular note if he was hand drawing it, whether it be oversized or actual currency sized Um, in the early days uh, prior to him making um, larger editions which would use a commercial copier Uh, but in those early days um, he would uh, either go out to dinner or try to purchase some equipment some artist equipment things like that and he would go up to the counter with his swagger in a way, and pull out a an envelope that contained several of his notes that he had done. And again, all are one-sided, uh, uh, the front of the note. And he would pull one yes, out. That's important, isn't it? Just to point yes. out that, you know, you know, there were one-sided. There was never any doubt that these were uh, artworks and not bills. Nobody was being duped. No, that's correct. And uh, the really only addition he did two-sided uh, was to save the Pittsburgh brew house. And uh, the front side would be one of his drawings. 
and on the back side would be five open coins where he would place his thumbprint in the center, and then each person that he exchanged that note with would place their thumbprint in the next and the next, uh, on and on. So that was a two-sided note. But his one-sided notes, the ones that he attempted to spend, um, he would offer a note to, let's say, um, the Mater D to pay for his meal. And, uh, you know, the guy would kind of like scratch his head and look and go, okay, is this guy for real or what? You know? So how, how can you describe, what, how would he approach that, you know, who you have witnessed it? How does one go up to someone with an artwork and literally say, you know, hey, would you take this as a payment? With a hand-drawn note, he'd um, present it to them as in lieu of payment, or they could accept a real bill, and he would lay two out, a real bill okay. and his, and he would say, okay. it took me weeks to finish this. It's a hand-drawn bill. It's a $100 note. And that's what I value at is its fate's value. Now, or you could accept this currency, which literally is one of the largest printed editions in the world um, <laughs> from the United States. And um, he would kind of test their decision-making ability. Um, mm -hmm. If they... Many of them would say, you know, I, I'm interested in the note. It's very beautiful and everything. Uh, but my employer probably wouldn't be so happy with me if I were to accept that note. Um, because they're at the bottom end within the restaurant business with several bosses that they have to answer to. And them taking a piece of art in lieu of actually taking real currency might be detrimental to their employment. Yes, yes. It, it, it therefore, you know, had actually quite a lot of um, potential consequences. So in, in that case, you know, in that context, how successful was he in this, in, for example, the restaurant scenario? Not very successful, most generally. Very? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, so they, you know, people maybe, generally tended to, to okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, people tended to go for the real currency instead of the artwork. Right. So, um, but let's say that we had someone that was willing to accept the artwork. And yeah. if his bill was $85 and change... Uh, he would request, after presenting the note that he drew, he would re request the change equivalent to its face value. Then on the mm -hmm. back side of the note, the blank side of the note, he would record all the serial numbers of the currency that he received, the dates of the coins, and all the details of the transaction on the back side of the note. He would then sign really? it. Yes. Yes. He highly really? documented every transaction. And then, oh, even, yes. wow. and then on each one of the notes that he received in change, he would document what number it belonged to on the back side of the note he drew. So each of the notes he received would have documentation. The coins he received he would uh, carve a letter into them so that they would relate to that particular transaction. And so there was a lot of work that went beyond him just trading his art for services. Yes, there's a very strong sense of tracking almost. Yes. Or at least the possibility of tracking to be able to uh, gather these pieces together and follow them in a way uh, as where they were to go. Because one thing that struck me uh, when I was reading about these transactions or listening um, to interviews is that, of course, he doesn't say to the purchaser, 
that somebody else might come along and buy that bill back for more. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, on a couple of occasions, I was out to dinner with him with several friends, and he had, he attempted a transaction, and he made it clear to everyone at the table, you cannot say anything. Okay? This has to be a pure mm -hmm. test of the mm -hmm. transaction. Um, now, once if the individual accepted his note, then anyone later could go off and say, I'll give you $300 for that $100 bill. Okay? But we could not yeah. encourage them uh, before the transaction had been processed. So from this perspective, we can clearly kind of say that Boggs was really trying to uh, not get them involved in any kind of investment in, you know, I'll take this note as investment because I could get more money. This guy's famous or a collector might come and give me the double. They really have to just sign on for the simple principle of this is a hundred dollar bill. Would you, or, you know, represents a hundred dollar bill. Would you take it from that? And these people literally do not know uh, that, you know, somebody literally could come down uh, the next day or that even evening and I, I offer them quite a significant more amount of money. Is that correct? Oh, very correct. Um, and it would test their view of what they thought had value. You know, does his art have value that equals its face value? Um, you know, on the same uh, length as a $100 United States banknote. And uh, mm -hmm. you could just see the wheels turn like, okay, this guy's got to be a crackpot or something and, uh, and that. Uh, on occasion, Boggs would also draw checks. Not hmm. just currency, but he would actually draw mm -hmm. a check to pay for a bill, and mm -hmm. which is accepted by the banking community. Um, so as long as it's got the numbers and everything on it, it's good. So, so that, in a sense, that, that, I suppose, could be considered legal tender in that sense? Uh, in that sense is that it can be processed just like any other check. It's just hand-drawn at that yeah, time. Because, of course, I, I think we see in checks the idea of promise to pay the payee. That's right. And it's, it's this, no, this notion of, which also is really what currency is based of, that the actual banknote, even the official banknotes, doesn't have a value they also have this idea of well you know it's based on in the bank if you need to come and get some gold bullion you know it's there or some sort of other uh, more real value and the notes never has value and we've obviously come to the point as a society to transfer the value onto the note um, but I think anybody who follows, you know, currency rises and falls and especially when the banks uh, you know crashed this is where you realize, you know, <laughs> what, what money is tied to. That's right. And just like uh, uh, other foreign countries that devalue their currency over time, um, you have to really know what the value of the governmental banknote is. And you accept that with the full faith, for instance, of the United States government, that that $100 bill is a $100 bill. Um, mm -hmm. so Boggs pushed those ideals and limits, you know, and they were, they're both pieces of art at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, you know, perhaps maybe that hand-drawn banknote has greater value than those printed by the, the governments. Well, this is what we come to see, really, isn't it, in the in the process around Boggs, is that typically somebody, a collector, the gallerist, would go and approach the person. Uh, as you say, Boggs didn't sell his art. He, he, he uh, spent it. So, you know, you couldn't just go and buy it from him. So, so then this. So can you tell me a little bit about this idea of the complete transaction? So if a transaction had been made utilizing one of his banknotes that he hand drew, one-sided, fully documented on the, on the back side, um, Boggs would take the change, the receipt, maybe a matchbook, uh, 
maybe a menu uh, and put all of that together, give it to a gallery owner who would then contact a collector that may have an interest in one of Boggs' bills, and they would give them all the information they needed to go to the restaurant that he spent it at and try to recover that. First, he would pay a multiple of two, three, four times what the change was, not knowing whether he would ever reunite it with the note that he spent. And uh, Okay. Try- so, so the collector bought one half of it, okay? Everything right. that Boggs yeah. got in return. So it was up to that individual with the address in hand, the name of the individual who accepted Boggs's bill to go after that hand-drawn note. And so that collector may go to the restaurant, uh, try to talk to the individual who received it. Uh, By then, who knows? The owner may have said, well, it's now my note and not your note. And so he may have to do his um, negotiating with the owner to try to get that hand-drawn bill that Boggs spent. And that could cost them multiples of the face value. Or the owner might even say, no, I'm not interested. I'm going to hang on to it for now. And so, so did you? How would you? Did you? Do you have any examples, maybe, of you know somebody holding on, or maybe somebody uh, charging a fortune, or uh, the the stories run the gambit on this, uh, from <laughs> small dollar size transactions um, all the way up to thousands of dollars, and uh, uh, it was probably about a fifty fifty split. Uh, and seeing how Boggs was successful maybe 30 to 40% of the time in conducting a transaction. So, but let's say that uh, the collector approached the owner. The owner said, sure, I'll sell it to you for $600. And if the owner was willing, or if the collector was willing, he'd purchase it from the owner. Then he would have the hand-drawn banknote all of the real currency and coin, the receipt, the menu, the matchbook, and in combining those together, he now has a complete transaction. In most of these cases, Boggs then would assist the collector with framing of the transaction. Now, this framing process would involve the note on its own that he hand drew and maybe each of the notes either individually framed or together. And then uh, the ephemeral items would also become part of the overall transaction from a displayable standpoint. And um, a number of pieces in a transaction could even run 20 that were framed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So might cover a wall. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they are incredible storytelling and really, uh, you know, speak to this whole performance and how uh, this one initial transaction kind of uh, blossoms into this wider, um, this wider picture. And uh would i think that today these these full sets are are quite rare and quite valuable is that correct uh they are they are the number of complete transactions out there i'm still working on putting everything together uh and trying to find out but it's minimal in the yeah. big big scope of things in the in the pbs uh money man a uh, documentary that they did on him, Boggs had purchased a motorcycle with mm-hmm. $1,000 notes and then drove it in the video and drove it and drove it and drove it. And uh, so that is one of the transactions that the archives does have. 
And uh, at some point, we're looking forward to um, restoring the motorcycle because it oh, fantastic! <laughs> it had a lot of wear on it. But uh, and then that one, you know, as an example, he would try to frame these in a unique way. And the motorcycle transaction, for instance, had a complete biker theme with each of the framed pieces. There were mm-hmm. silver studs against black frames, you know, the leather jacket type, and uh, pretty fascinating. Yeah, I mean, um, so there's a kind of an artistic input right to the end, and an and input right to the end. So you can see Boggs being very present from the start to the finish of this process. And I have to say, like, the idea of him on a motorway, you know, riding off into the distance seems strangely to fit the image one could have of Boggs. Mm-hmm. Um, so that gives a really good idea of this notion of um, the transaction and what that looks like. I wanted to just touch upon um, the the run-ins that um, Boggs had with the law, because this is all part of the process, and it's, and in a way, embraced by Boggs. Um, I mean, I, I, you can maybe present how this, I know there's many examples, you can choose what you will, but certainly as we're launching our first uh, edition here with the, the British uh, pound note, so it's going to be a 50 pound note, but so the British currency played a big role in um, his image and, uh, and his run-ins with the law, if you'd like oh, to tell us more. Oh, certainly. Boggs loved England. Um, he would go back there numerous times. Uh, but in the mid eighties, uh, he had an exhibition at the gallery of the, the young unknowns, uh, basically. And, uh, he had written a letter to the bank of England, uh, requesting permission to reproduce on one side, uh, their banknotes. And he had, uh, received a, a resounding no. It's not allowed by the Bank of England. No. So so he wrote a second time, and that was a resounding no. And so Scotland Yard was sent to um, the gallery, and they confiscated a number of pieces of his original artwork of British banknotes, United States banknotes, whatever they took off the wall. Uh, They labeled with their sticker and everything that it would become um, an exhibit during his trial. And uh, his trial was held at the Old Bailey. And while he was uh, in the cell awaiting to be called up uh, for the trial, he had requested a uh, sketchbook. And so while he was waiting, he also did sketches in the jail cell <laughs> um oh, of, of the, notes one would presume. Of, notes, <laughs> of notes and of the queen and of the magistrate and uh beyond and um the jury it took them 10 minutes to make the decision you know basically mm-hmm. because these are one-sided impressions uh, mm-hmm. No mm-hmm. one could confuse these with actual British banknotes. And mm-hmm. the British government had charged him with counterfeiting because their notes didn't carry the copyright symbol. Well, following their loss in this trial against Boggs, uh, the Bank of England on uh, notes that they would produce as Time went on, they added the copyright symbol. So now they could actually charge someone with copyright infringement and make it stick. So in a sense, in essence, what you're saying is Boggs changed the face of British banknotes forever, huh? He certainly <laughs> did. <laughs> in more than one way. So, in more than one way. In more than so one that, way. Would it be fair to say that he's pretty chilled when he's being taken off in handcuffs? Or how does how does Boggs react oh. in those situations? Yeah, he's uh, somebody that takes it all in stride. 
because mm-hmm. it just adds to his notoriety. And so, you know, he plays the role uh, in going through it. So, uh, yeah, he's never ultimately tested. He gets he was would get frustrated, especially with the Supreme Court in the United States and also the appeals hearings and because they drag it out for years. And uh, Mm -hmm. it's not that difficult a decision to make. So but he would he would take it in stride. So, yeah, because, I mean, you know, being dragged off by the old bill in, in London town, you know, it, uh, of course, could, could you know, stress anyone out. But, uh, yeah, the, the image you would have of Vox is the opposite. And uh, so, yeah, you mentioned the Supreme Court. And I do believe there is, a you know, uh, a certain amount of Vox work still with the federal government. Is, is that correct? That is correct. So, and, and hopefully it'll be released one day, but, uh, uh, the treasury department still holds it. And there's a, there's a fair amount, it would seem. Uh, yes, several boxes actually, uh, well over a thousand items. And we're not even sure of all of those items because the inventory he was allowed to create was inconclusive. So yeah, we're hoping to, to return those. You could almost say that they have one of the largest collections of bogs in the world. Uh, that is true, as they have <laughs> confiscated works of art from artists in the 19th century and early 20th century mm-hmm. um, because for counterfeiting. And um, they still hold those notes and put them prominently on display within their building. <laughs> the irony of it all. The irony yeah. of it all. I th- I'm pretty sure that there's some uh, Boggs fans within the within the staff, um, but yeah, well, we may never know. Well, um, but you, you know, so, Katie, yeah. in a way, uh, we all wish we had a little Boggs in us. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, he he certainly. Um, I think he got a lot of media attention as well because of this. Everybody, I think, is fascinated by this notion of, of you know, what is money, and you know, going against this, uh, this concept. And of course, uh, we 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 are addressing this in the the project we're doing with the La Collection because we're bringing bogs into the crypto era. And of course, you know, what is Bitcoin if it, it's not a um, a uh, c- counter currency? You know, something that's challenging the 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 uh, status quo of federal reserves and banks. Absolutely, and Boggs would love it. <laughs> Boggs would love it. Uh, what what you, you who know him? How would you um how uh, how what do you think he would think of this? I mean, I, I think he was already thinking about pro- that in earlier projects. He was, and this would just be another extension of his um performance art in a way, you know, entering the realm of the blockchain and trying to understand all of that. I'm still trying to get my head around it. Uh, But Boggs was someone who could do calculations in his head without much thought. Um, He could process everything and, uh, and lead to it. So I think he was he was certainly headed in that direction. Yes, and I think you mentioned in a previous conversation that um, his work evolved um, actually using new technology, so new print processes. So he was also very interested in new technology already, um, you know, in the 90s. That's, that's correct. Um, his art transformed from being hand-drawn into the digital media um, he would use um, the best of the computer systems, the programs, the latest that were out there, and also the latest in uh, color copier technology. Not your mm-hmm. typical home printer, but uh, those that are used by very large commercial companies to produce color. And he was very much involved in the print process as well. Oh, very much. Uh, I can only imagine 
uh, probably the frustration from the individual trying to please him for the proper color <laughs> and consistency, uh, because he would create numerous proofs with too light, too dark, uh, too blurry, you know, not defined, and go through that process many times until they got just the right setting for him to produce the notes that would be acceptable. So definitely a perfectionist. And of course he was, um, some of the notes actually in our upcoming drop, are notably the Euro, are, are digitally produced. Um, so he was actually, you know, um, quite early on using um, computer design to, to create his artworks. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And he was still, though, he still had a foot in the past uh, because um, he had an engraved plate made uh, that featured his portrait. And uh, that portrait was engraved by uh, Thomas Hipschen, who was the master portrait engraver at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. And so it was done on a large steel plate with his portrait right in the center. And his hope was is to produce an edition that would have been engraved. So while in the digital yeah. age, because even now the Bureau of Engraving and Printing uses computers to create mm -hmm. their designs, um, he still had that foot back in the age of hand engraving and was fascinated yeah. by it. And so he's used that portrait on a couple of editions, um, but in a digital sense and not an engraved sense. <laughs> yes, that's fascinating. That's true. That That is this kind of like the past and the future coming together in his works. Because, of course, if we look at the euro that's in coming up in our future drop from 2002, you know, th this digital artwork he was doing, uh, not a lot of artists were working uh, using this type of media. And of course, and he's integrating this um, engraving. One can only assume that that would have been his ultimate desire to have this engraving made by the official engraver. And the portrait, of course, looks very uh, apt to be found and is found, therefore, on several of the notes, including the uh, the euro, I, I think. So um, did he speak to you about this engraving in particular? Or Oh, I was there the night that, uh, that Boggs and and Tom uh, cemented the agreement. Uh, I was at the Peabody mm -hmm. Hotel in Orlando, Florida, and uh, it's about 11 o'clock at night. So uh, Boggs like to keep very late and very early hours. And uh, uh, so they, you know, worked it out back and forth and everything and came to an agreement. Uh, Boggs paid uh, the down payment, which was a $1,000 Project Pittsburgh note, two-sided, not one-sided, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, held both of their thumbprints on it. And uh, it would take Tom a little while because doing a portrait engraving takes time. Uh, but it was delivered to Boggs uh, with some um, pulls from the engraving to show him uh, the positive uh, since, since the engraving is in reverse. And, uh, and so Boggs utilized the, uh, that in his art. So um, the engraver, was he in a sense a fan or a friend of Boggs already? How did this uh, meeting come about? Uh, they had been talking about it for some time. Uh, Boggs had actually visited the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and had spoken with Tom Hipschen there even uh, on one of the uh, documentaries uh, to talk about it. And they had been talking about it for some time, uh, but it was to produce just his portrait was around $12,000. And Boggs was going to pay for it in $1,000 Boggs bills, uh, which he did. I which he did, which, which is did. only, only, only right for him to. So clearly the, the engraver, I think, uh, had a lot of respect and uh, interest in the artist's work because that, that was very much a, a passion project, clearly, for him to, to spend all this time creating this beautiful portrait. 
Um, I, I'm going to kind of uh, wrap up on this side before we just uh, quickly talk about the drop, just to really ask you what your kind of most unforgettable memory uh, is with Boggs. I imagine you guys uh, went, lived many different experiences. And yeah, w- which one is the, maybe the, the one that marked you the most? Probably the most memorable is I did a um, a letterpress uh, note for him that we worked on oh one afternoon all the way into early the next morning, uh, and it was all done by hand press, hand printing, two different sizes, a couple of different colors, back and forth, really getting to understand that quality mattered to him it always mattered to me in doing letterpress but it really mattered to him and so if a place was a piece was too light too dark um it was relegated and he never threw any of those away uh he Mm. kept everything in including the what we call the tympan sheet which is uh the back sheet on the plate uh that had an impression on it uh, he would make sure that he pulled everything. Well, the next day, uh, I had him over to the house, and uh, our 18th month old son was uh, sitting at the table. And my kids, knowing Boggs was coming, had out their crayons and markers and everything else on the table with paper. And uh, <laughs> Boggs sat down next to Tim. And uh, started sketching him in Crayola marker, you know. And here's this redheaded little kid in a bib overhaul suit. And uh, <laughs> Boggs drew it and signed it. And he says, now, I want to make, tell you one thing. I never want to see this offered for sale. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but to just have Boggs sit down with the kids and draw mm-hmm. right along with them, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, he gave presentations to schools and, and you know, whoever was interested. And uh, so that, that following day was really memorable. Yeah, that's a beautiful personal memory. And he seems to be someone who really could talk to anyone. Would Definitely. that be? Yeah. 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 So quite 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 a quite a, a bit of humanity in a way, even though yeah. some in some ways he's he's um, confronting people with the difficult truths. Um, there seems to be a, a real w- a desire to exchange and to be, speak to people and to and to share in a way, and, and also to be the showman. You know, for performance art, you really have to be on your game and. He always oh, was. Sure. So, oh, for sure, for sure. Well, that's wonderful. And actually, uh, um, you know what you're describing this night of running through the printing process and really experiencing what it was is is quite relevant to to our, our project that we're doing today uh, with the estate and la collection, which of course uh, is a digital NFT, which is something that we all wish to bring forward for Bogs. As we know, it's something he that the blockchain would have definitely be where he would be working today if he uh, were alive. Um, but yeah, this idea came forward to to really create this global transaction. So to with the NFT to have this edition of the print of the of the note, um, which you can tell us about, and also the transaction receipt. So yeah, you're showing like wonderful, and yeah. the transaction receipts. So we, what we've aimed to do with this, of course, is to give people the possibility to create these the complete transaction, but also to exchange them, to pass them on, to sell them, to do whatever you want. And that's what Bogs is all about. Um, so I know you're going to bring a lot of expertise and care into the creation of these prints. It, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you're going to do this? Sure. Uh, doing this in the same process that uh, uh, Boggs would utilize, and that is uh, he might put two or three notes 
on a sheet, and then they would each be hand cut out. Okay? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the back of the sheet would be embellished mm -hmm. with various things, including his thumbprint and some rubber stamps and some oh, colored uh, crayons or whatever. Because uh, back in the days of colonial times, the British government even, uh, they would save the tear-out sheets so that if a note was ever in question as to being a counterfeit, and there are counterfeit Boggs notes out there, uh, he could put it back into the sheet and it would match up. If it didn't match up, we knew it would be a counterfeit. So each of these notes uh, is going to be created by the same digital process that uh, Boggs utilized. Uh, the back of the note would be embellished with uh, an image of his thumbprint. You can see up here that you could see half of his signature, the other half being on mm -hmm. the upper note. And then some mm -hmm. rubber stamps in that, and also carrying over the serial number, because this is a limited edition of 50 of this particular note, mm -hmm. the serial mm -hmm. number would also be carried over onto the back. Uh, from mm -hmm. that standpoint, it'll be done on security paper, um, just like a regular Boggs note. And it'll be hand numbered, one of 50, two of 50, all the way up to 50 notes, uh, which is a really a very exclusive edition of a Boggs note. And uh, this also carries the copyright of the archives of JSG Boggs uh, because it has been uh, produced off of a note that is in the archives. So with that, uh, you'll also receive the uh, receipt that uh, La Collection has uh, produced that also features an image of the note that you'll be receiving. So kind of a neat little package. I suspect with these being limited editions of 50, they're not gonna be around long. So given uh, what his other notes uh, uh, bring and trade for, uh, because there will be collectors that will want that as well as mm -hmm. the NFT. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in a way, we're really inviting collectors of Boggs collectors and crypto collectors to to continue his story. To uh, to for those who don't know his work yet, of course, to to delve into it, um, to get involved in. And as you say, you know, there, there's this project, but then the, there's the hunt, of course, for other notes that can be found, can be sold privately, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, maybe we can just conclude with um, just what you're going to be doing next uh, with the archive. You you are the curator. Um, so just maybe uh, you can let us know what's next, what's coming up next. Sure. I'm still in the process of uh, sorting through all of his personal papers. Um, all of the um, issues that he created, putting them in a chronological order. And that would be including all the known transactions uh, that I can come up with and creating a master database of his work. Uh, and that's really the key. Um, aside from putting everything in order, because there was uh, quite a bit of art. And uh, so we've been going through that. And uh, it's going to take a little while. <laughs> It is. It is. And in the meantime, of course, you're loaning works as well, because there's a work that's gone to Cambridge in the UK, to the Fitzwilliam, a, a, a very large artwork. Um, so I presume you, you'll be continuing to, to show works uh, by Boggs in museums uh, across the world. Oh, definitely. The, uh, the work that the Fitzwilliam Museum has is titled Cirrus, and it is a five foot by 12 foot painting on canvas of a $100 uh, note uh, with Benjamin Franklin. Um, and, you know, also this past year, the British Museum found a piece that had been tucked away somewhere that Boggs had uh, uh, loaned them for an exhibit called Fake in 1990 and actually donated it to him. So uh, that has the Scotland Yard stickers on it. So it's one of the exhibits uh, from his trial. 
That's real exciting. That's yes. on permanent permanent loan to the British Museum. Or I should say and it's I on heard. permanent exhibit. Yes. Yeah, and I, I heard uh, that it was being shown beside a Banksy. I haven't seen that, yes. but it would be kind of apt. <laughs> it would. Of course. It would. I think there's definite connections between these two, you know, uh, these artists who take on society in some sense. Well, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today, Craig. Thank you so much for sharing all this uh, incredible information about the life of Boggs and, and how he worked. Oh, thank you, Katie. I I appreciate being part of it. Wonderful. Well, uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon for the Boggs Collectors. We'll be able to um, to have a Q&A session with you uh, for people who buy more than uh, two NFTs. And also we'll be having a fireside chat with Jeff, who's also part of the estate. And uh, yeah, so lots more to come. So once again, thanks so much, Craig. And I, I'll sign off here. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.